looks like it gets a bit higher here, but it's not significant. Okay. But again, uh, as I said earlier, Asuko is a polychaete expert, so she was able to go back through these worms and identify them down to species level. Looking at the airport station, she didn't collect any polychaetes outside the canopy. All the polychaetes she collected were in the canopy, so she, was ha she had to throw this part out. So for her comparison, she just used the sea tiger site. And although it looks like there's a, a, a trend for higher numbers of species within the canopy, it was not statistically significant. Okay, this is total abundance of n faunal organisms, just counting the number of organisms that are there in each site. Okay, again, sand and canopy for each of the three sites. This was the airport, sea tiger port, and sea tiger starboard. Just counting the number of individuals, there was a significant difference between the number of microinvertebrates in the sand stations and the canopy stations. The number of microinvertebrates was significantly higher in the canopy. Okay. This is kind of the opposite of what we were seeing with fish abundance. Microinvertebrates more abundant in the canopy, less abundant in the sand. Again, because she could identify the polychaetes to species and know that they were polychaetes, she went back and counted the polychaetes in each of these stations and found the same type of relationship. Significantly more polychaetes within the canopy, within the green leafy area, than in the sand. Okay, so to summarize her invertebrate data, the seagrass canopy supports a higher number of macroinvertebrates compared to the non-vegetated sandy area. Four taxonomic categories, segmented worms, uh, arthropods, nematodes, and nematians, accounted for about 90% of the end faunal organisms. Okay. Now, what the diversity did not seem to differ significantly between the site where there was lots of, uh, lots of seagrass and the site where there was no seagrass, but the end faunal abundance did differ significantly. A lot more individuals in the seagrass areas. Okay, so overall summary. Based on the small number of surveys and collections that I've done in Hawaiian meadows, the Scipions meadows seem to have a much higher fish diversity. But again, as Kim said, these collections that I did were at low tide, so I might be underestimating the diversity of fishes in Hawaiian meadows. Thus far, we've only seen eight different species in Hawaiian meadows versus 38 in the Decipians meadows. And both Decipians and Hawaiian fish diversity and abundance seems to be greater and the sandy areas uh, outside the meadow or within the actual blowouts themselves than within the vegetated area. Okay. In contrast, invertebrates tend to be more abundant within the vegetated area, although their diversity does not differ significantly between sandy areas and areas where there's seagrass. Okay. Lastly, I just want to point out some things that we'd like to do um, before we finish this up. It's one thing is do a whole lot more surveys, uh, both visual surveys and using clove oil. Um, we haven't done a whole lot of clove oil surveys from the Decipians meadows, and we want to see what those small bodied fishes are doing. Um, as I've shown you before, the use of clove oil or an anesthetic can really enhance your ability to sample some of these small bodied fishes that are either buried in the sediment or are down low in the canopy itself. Okay. We also need to identify the invertebrates associated with the Holophila Hawaiiana meadows. When we do these clove oil stations, you're not just getting the fish that are there, but any epiphytic invertebrates that are clinging to the leaves of the blades of the seagrass, and they blow off, and we collect those as well. So we already have these preserved. We just need to go back and identify them and see if there's any difference uh, in taxonomic composition between the sandy area and the area where the seagrass exists. Okay, that's all I have. Is there any questions?